Welcome back. Last time we finished generating legal moves for all the chess pieces. In this video, we will enable the current player to choose and execute a move. Here is how it will work. First, the current player clicks on the piece he wants to move. Then the game will highlight all positions it can move to. The player can then choose such a position and the piece will move there. Now it's the other player's turn. If you click on one piece, but then decide you actually want to move another, you can either click on the same piece again to cancel, or on a square where the piece cannot move. Ok, let's close these tabs. And open up mainwindow.saml. Here we'll add another uniform grid called Highlight Grid. This grid will hold the green squares, which show where the selected piece can move. It's important that you put it above the piece grid, so the highlights are rendered behind pieces that may be captured. We need one highlight for each square, so we set both rows and columns to 8. We also need to detect when a player clicks somewhere on the board. To do that, let's register an event handler for the board grid's mouse down event. If you press enter here, the event handler will be generated automatically. Great. Now we can go to the code behind. Here we first add a 2D rectangle array for our highlights. It will provide easy access to the highlight in a certain position, just like our piece images array does for the pieces. Next, we need a dictionary called move cache. And a selected position variable which is set to null initially. With these variables in place, let me explain in a bit more detail how moving a piece will work. First, the current player clicks on the piece he wants to move. That piece is now selected and its position is stored in selected position. Then we ask the game state which moves the selected piece can make. These moves are then stored in the move cache using their two position as the key. And we show them on screen using the highlight squares. Next, the player clicks on one of the highlights. When that happens, we get the corresponding move from the cache and execute it. First of all, we have to create the highlights. Let's do that in the initialize board method. Here we currently create all the image controls for the pieces and add them to both the piece grid and our piece images array. We will do the same thing for our highlights now. For each position, we create a rectangle. Store it in the Highlights array. And add it as a chart to the Highlight grid.
The highlights are transparent by default, so they won't be visible until we need them. Next, we need a few helper methods. The first one is called cache moves. It takes the collection of legal moves for the selected piece and stores them in the cache. First, we empty anything that may be in the cache already. Then we loop over the given moves. And store each of them in the dictionary using their two position as the key. Next, we add a show highlights method. We must first decide which color the highlights should be. I'll choose a semi transparent green color. Next, we loop over the keys in the move cache Remember that these are the two positions of all moves the selected piece can make. So for each of them, we change the color of the highlight at that position to green. Let's create the opposite method as well. I'll call it Hide Highlights. It loops through all the highlighted positions. Again, these are the two positions of all moves the selected piece can make. So we make the highlights for those positions transparent. Perfect. Now let's handle some user input. For that, we locate the board grid mouse down event handler. This method is called when a player clicks somewhere on the board. Here, we first get the click point relative to the board grid. The coordinates of this point is given in pixels, but we want to know which square was clicked. So let's add a helper method called toSquarePosition. It takes a point as parameter and returns the row and column of the square containing that point. First, we must find out how large a square is at the current window size. Because our board grid is always a square, we can just take its actual width or height and divide by 8. Then, to find the row, we take the point's y-coordinate, divided by the square size, and cast the whole thing to an integer. For the column, we do the same, 
but using the point x coordinate instead. Finally, we return the row and column as a position. Back in the event handler, we can now convert the click point to a square position. What we want to do with that position depends. If no piece is currently selected, we invoke a method called onFromPositionSelected. And if a piece is selected, we invoke one called on two position selected. Let's write on from position selected first. This method is called when a square is clicked and there is no selected piece. The position parameter is the clicked square. First, we get the legal moves for the piece on that square. This collection will be empty if the player clicked on an empty square, an opponent piece, or just a piece which currently cannot move. If there is at least one legal move, we consider the given position selected, cache the moves, and show highlights for them. Assuming a piece is now selected, the player's next click will call on two position selected instead. Here we set selected position back to null. Hide the highlights. And then try to get the move with two position equal to the clicked position. If it exists, we pass it to a method called handle move. This method tells the game state to execute the given move. And then redraws the board to reflect the changes. Let's check it out. First, it's white's turn to move. And now it should be black's turn so nothing will happen if I click on a white piece. But I can of course move a black piece. This works great, but maybe it can be a bit difficult to tell which player's turn it is. To solve this problem, I've created two cursors, a white one and a black one. The cursor should be white when it's white's turn to move and black when it's black's turn. Let's store them in a class called Chess Cursors.
just like the images class, we'll make it static. Okay, let's add a load cursor method. Loading cursors is a bit more annoying than loading images. Simply passing a relative path to the cursor constructor won't work. We must load them using a stream. We'll call application.getResourceStream It has a constructor which takes a URI. Here we pass in our file path and specify that it's a relative path. Get resource stream returns a stream resource info object. To get the actual stream, we use its stream property. Now we can return a new cursor, passing in the stream, and for the scale with DPI parameter, we pass in true. The cursors I've created contain multiple sizes. By setting scale with DPI to true, Windows will pick the size best suited for your screen settings. Perfect. Now we can add two static variables for our cursors. That's it for this class. Let's head back to the code behind for main window. Here we'll add a set cursor method. It takes the current player as parameter. If that player is white, We use the white cursor. And if it's black, we use the black cursor. Set cursor should be called in the constructor when the game starts. And after a move is made, inside handle move. Now the color of the cursor indicates which player's turn it is. That's it for this part. Now our game is almost playable. But some of you may have noticed that some of the moves we generate are actually not legal. In the next part, we take care of this issue. See you then.